Hi, everybody. I'm glad you're here tonight because it's such an exciting speaker. This is uh, Julia Douglas, and it's her second time speaking to us. She was so interesting the first time, so we asked her again. And she grew up in Honolulu and is currently now working on her PhD in the botany department at the University of Hawaii. She studies the ecology of epiphytic orchids. I hope I pronounced that right. Yeah. Um, and she's currently living in Mexico for a year on a Fulbright scholarship. And she is working with the community in Oaxaca, Oaxaca. It's spelled O-A-X-A-C-A. -A -A. Uh, she's on an orchid restoration project. She loves interesting vegetation, cloud forests, surfing, surfing, and ceramics. Mm -hmm. And tonight we have uh, from, from Mexico, the uh, canopy ecology of epiphytic orchids in the Osa Peninsula, Peninsula in Costa Rica. So Julia, we're really excited to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Okay, can you see it? Is yes. It okay. okay, yeah, stop me at any point if you can't hear me or it's not working anymore. <laughs> uh, okay, well, thank you to the Honolulu Orchid Society for having me again. I'm really excited to speak uh, to you folks and excited to participate in person, hopefully when I come back home in a year. Um, and so I'm going to split the presentation today up into two sections. Um, the first, I'm going to give kind of an update on my project in Oaxaca here in Mexico, and then the second half, I'll talk about my work in Costa Rica. And so both of these elements are chapters of my PhD. And so originally I started with um, working in Mexico, but I wasn't able to go for a few years uh, during the pandemic. And so while I wasn't able to go, I kind of developed this other project in Costa Rica and uh, worked on that in 2021. And so that um, is in, the field work for Costa Rica is entirely done. That was all last year. Um, but now I'm back in Mexico right now working um, to finish the restoration project. And so, yeah, I'll start first talking about uh, the biocultural restoration of Prosechia karwinskii in Oaxaca. And so um, this is the species that I'm working with in Oaxaca. Some of you might remember from when I talked a year or two ago. Uh, it's called Prosechia karwinskii in the Orchidaceae, and it is an epiphytic orchid. And so epiphytes uh, are plants that live on the substrate of trees in the canopy, but they're not parasitic. And so they don't um, use any of the carbohydrates or any of the nutrients or take anything from the tree. They're just using it um, as structure uh, for them to grow on. And so many of the orchids that uh, you folks grow um, are epiphytes, even if they're uh, rooted and you have them in pots or hanging or in kind of a different, different types of medium uh, in the wild, they would be growing epiphytically on a tree. And so this is the orchid that I'm working with. It's called La Monjita is the name um, that people call it there. And it grows in the pine oak forests of Oaxaca. And Oaxaca is a state on the southwest coast, uh, kind of southwest area of Mexico. Um, it's mountainous with mountains up to 10,000 feet tall and has lots of pine oak forest um, where this orchid lives. And so the specific town that I'm working in is Villa de Zachila, which is uh, in kind of the central valleys of Oaxaca. And I'm working in this town because it has a long tradition of using this uh, orchid uh, traditionally to adorn uh, and use the flower in celebrations. And so because of that, I'm focusing um, on this specific species orchid uh, or orchid species. I know you uh, folks call it a species orchid, but I might call it a orchid species uh, in this town. And so I've been, I, work, I started this project four years ago and have since been three times to kind of work on it through the different years. And and so it's used uh, traditionally, so people harvest the pseudo bulbs, so those storage bulb structures and the flowers during the spring, so it only flowers in the spring. And so local people go out into the forest and collect um, thousands of these orchids to uh, decorate their town. And so up to 10,000 have been reported to uh, be taken from the surrounding forest. 
Um, but it's uh, because there's been such a heavy harvest combined with climate change and other land use changes, the orchid is in decline. And so um, it, we really need to think of conservation strategies if we want to prevent uh, the extinction of the orchid. But it's important to also remember that this cultural tradition of orchid harvest is very important to the people of Zachila and Oaxaca. And so uh, any kind of strategy in which you just prohibit the harvest of orchids would be uh, unethical and disrespectful of this tradition. And so an effective strategy has to kind of work with the people of Zachila and um, allow for the continuation of some amount of sustainable harvest, hopefully. And so I went back in 2022, earlier this year in the spring, and documented and participated in a lot of these orchid harvesting trips. And so I went with orchid harvesters and then um, kind of took pictures of how they were using them. And so then in these uh, Samana Santa Easter parades, um, thousands of people will have the orchids in their sombreros with the, the, the they call it pasle uh, here, or uh, Tillandsia is noides or Pele's hair, we call it back home. And so they make these adornments of the Pele's hair and the native orchids. Uh, they also then use it to make these offerings and um, elaborate decorations on the um, altars of their neighborhood churches. And so thousands of the orchids, you can see them with the pseudobulbs, are used for these adornments. So this last year, um, 4,000 about, I counted, in the different churches of this town in, in Oaxaca. And they're really beautiful um, adornments. You can see them hanging from the outside of the churches and people go around um, during Semana Santa and um, pay their respects to each of the churches. Um, and so it's, um, it's a, at this point, a Catholic tradition, but uh, it was the use of this orchid for ornamentation is pre-conquest um, and pre-Columbian. And so they have them hanging from the ceiling on these different uh, types of other native plants laid out on the ground. And they also have a very strong fragrance, uh, this kind of citrusy fragrance there in the Catlea Alliance. Um, and so it's a really amazing, strong fragrance that they have in the churches are filled with them during the celebrations. And so to create, uh, to work on conservation strategies earlier this spring, we held um, a series of meetings with the traditional orchid harvesters of the town. And so I work with the municipio or the, the small town government, and we kind of called a meeting. And so this is the group of concheros or orchid harvester representatives that showed up to talk about conservation of this plant. Um, and they're all really uh, um, enthusiastic about participating because they have noticed throughout their lifetimes and their grandfather's lifetimes the slow decline of the number of plants that they can find when they go out into the forests and try to harvest them. And so um, people are interested in conserving the plant as long as the conservation does, uh, does allow them to continue using it uh, for their religious and ornamental purposes. And so it was really exciting that this many people showed up to talk about it back in March. And so the conservation strategy we've identified is reintroduction because the way that the people um, harvest the plant is that they'll twist one of the pseudo bulbs off with the flower, with the inflorescence. So they take the entire pseudo bulb um, because they want the flower to last longer in the parades and in the adornments. And so um, because this is the way that they harvest them, the, there is a shoot meristem or a bud at the base of the pseudo bulbs. So this allows um, us to reintroduce it or to transplant it after it's used in the Semana Santa uh, celebrations. So instead of just discouraging people from harvesting, um, we could reuse material that is otherwise discarded because usually they just either compost or let them dry, let the pseudobulbs dry out after the parties. Usually they don't reintroduce them. Um, and so yeah, here's some just results from a preliminary study where we showed that 65% of single pseudobulbs were capable of growing. And uh, you folks probably know this from various um, orchid orchids that you um, grow that if you cut off certain sections of pseudobulbs or of the rhizome that you can uh, create an entirely new individual. And so um, the different orchid harvesters from the different neighborhoods um, agreed to donate a lot of their orchids after Semana Santa. So after all those adornments were made and the parades happened and all the thousands of orchids were used, um, these men from each of the neighborhoods collected their orchids and then brought them to the municipio to donate to um, the project that I'm working on to re restore some of these plants. Um, and traditionally, it's only men who go out and harvest orchids. That's why it's uh, mostly men here, or all men. <laughs> the 
some of the neighborhoods are starting to have a few young women uh, join them on their harvesting trip. So maybe it's changing a little bit, but it's a very uh, traditional place. And so uh, 800 pseudobulbs of Persetia Karwinskii were donated this April, which is really exciting here. They all are laid out. Oh, so we measured them all and gave them all individual tags uh, and brought them back to the Pine Oak Forest. And so this is um, the site that I uh, started working in. So it's in Santa Ines, which as you can see on the map is just to the west up into the mountains from Zachila. Um, and so these, uh, these mountains have a Pine Oak Forest that is suitable for uh, this species of orchid to grow. And so we selected for this just first year 15 trees or it's called audibles in this uh, map. And those were the 15 trees that we attached the 800 orchids onto. And so the way that we uh, transplanted or reintroduced them um, was to use a wire to strap them really tightly to the, uh, the trunk of the tree um, and then also use a small amount of silicon to really attach them um, onto the trunk. And so this was recommended to me by um, one of the orchid researchers here um, in at the university that you really don't want them to move at all or else they won't we'd be able to establish their roots. And so using a little bit of silicon might help, but this is still experimental. And so we're still trying to figure out the best way to attach them to the trees without um, injuring them and hoping for the highest survivorship. So even at the end of this talk, if some of you folks, because you're experienced in growing orchids have ideas about how to best attach them, we're open to ideas. Um, and so uh, we would attach 10 pseudobulbs to the lower part of the trunk and I would uh, climb the tree with my ropes and attach 20 to the higher part of the canopy. And so all, um, of the 800 donated, only about 400 were actually in suitable enough kind of condition to reintroduce and transplant. And so this uh, first year of transplanting, we um, transplanted 450 and that was in April of this year. And so um, this was uh, the first attempt to see if we can establish a new population and save some of the orchid material after they're used for the ornamentations um, and uh, contribute, not solve the problem of a, of a species in at risk of extinction, but contribute to the conservation of this species. And so these are some pictures that are very exciting that were taken um, in a few weeks after post planting in May, after the first rain had fallen on these orchids. And you can see that they're already starting to grow their roots at the base of the pseudobulb, which is very exciting. Um, and so I haven't been back since May. Then so there's a family of people um, who are taking care or kind of watching over the site and they send me pictures once in a while sometimes they're kind of blurry like the one on the right but I, you get the idea that it's pretty exciting that they are growing roots and so um, hopefully they'll also grow shoots and establish full size plants from these single bulbs. I would be happy with even a 30% survivorship rate, even 10% like anything more than them the just all being discarded and dying um, would be a success, I think. Um, and then it's also kind of uh, hopefully a symbolic project too to work with the orchid harvesters and the town. Um, we're all collaborating on this. And even if we don't actually establish new population of plants, one of the results could be kind of a slightly shifted mindset um, of the traditional harvesters there to work on conservation strategies and um, to think about how they can contribute to this. In the past, there was such an abundance of this species that people could really take as many as they, want, they wanted and there wouldn't be a impact, uh, but that's kind of uh, culminated in the current situation of there being uh, fewer and fewer every year. And so um, the perspective needs to shift and the tradition really needs to adapt to new um, ecological realities. Uh, but that can't come from an external source like myself or any other kind of um, external land manager that has to come from the community itself and from the local people there. And so uh, hoping to contribute to that process. So here's some of the people from the municipio who are helping me. Um, they would come out and reintroduce and plant the orchids. You can see us all holding the various ones um, as we would plant them. Um, and so this is the family of people who are taking care of the Orchids in Santa Ines. Their names are Giovanni, Sara, and Kevin um, um, Gaspar Reyes. And this is the sign that we made uh, to put on the site. It says, uh, this is a site of restoration and um, research of monjitas or yellow orchids. Uh, please do not court, uh, cut or take away the plants. Um, leave them for everybody, take care of them. And so hopefully when I, I'm gonna return in um, 
late October to measure survivorship and really hoping to find um, some of them doing well. Um, yes, and to wrap up this section of the presentation, I'd definitely like to say thank you to the Concheros of Zachu, the orchid harvesters for sharing their traditions with me and collaborating with me on the project. It's taken uh, multiple years to kind of get it going, but it's uh, hopefully um, an exciting way to uh, conserve this species, which is so uh, beautiful and important. And here's the different groups of um, concheros or orchid harvesters from every neighborhood going out to find plants uh, to decorate the town. Okay, so moving on to the second section. Okay, so um, the second section that I'll be talking about is about uh, the ecology of the Osa Peninsula's epiphytic orchids, specifically looking at environmental variables that influence abundance and species composition of the canopy community. And so, as I said before, this is a different uh, chapter of my, uh, of my dissertation. And the field work for this occurred last year in the summer of 2021. I went down or over east to Costa Rica and worked on this. And so just to geographically orient us a little bit, Costa Rica is in Central America between Panama and Nicaragua. Um, and so it's a with pretty thin country with the um, Caribbean on one side, the Pacific on the other, um, also quite mountainous and very tropical, and also with an extraordinarily high diversity of orchids, as many of you might have heard, or maybe some of you have gotten the chance to visit Costa Rica. And the place that I worked was on the western coast, and so the Pacific coast in a lowland forest of the Osa Peninsula. And so this peninsula is special because um, its forest is really well preserved, and it's one of the largest remaining tracts of lowland wet forest in Central America. And so a lot of this lowland forest type is lost to development or to agriculture, but this um, area is pretty well uh, preserved. So a really high canopy of 100 to 100 foot tall, 150 foot tall, or 200 foot sometimes tall trees, um, very diverse with lots of um, animals and orchid diversity and insect diversity. And so there was a there's a uh, biological station called Piro Biological Station that I got a fellowship to work at through an organization called Osa Conservation. And so I was there for um, seven months, living and working, um, and collecting information on the orchids there. And the Osa Peninsula is pretty um, not super inhabited. There's a there's a town called Puerto Jimenez that's right at this tip, um, and. I'm not sure the population, but there's most of it is forest and a few agricultural areas, not uh, very populated. And so the context for this project um, is that there's approximately 1800 species of native orchid, so specific species native to Costa Rica, and about 150 of those are found in the Osa Peninsula. Um, within Piro, so within the station I was working at, we have about 40 common species, and these all have very wide distribution. So this kind of means that there's, the place I was working didn't actually have a huge um, diversity of orchid species. It was like there's some places in Costa Rica where you might have um, 100 species, maybe 50 species at least on a single tree. Um, but I would usually find between you know five to 10 species on a tree, but this made it easier to do large scale surveys of um, habitat preferences. And so I'll talk more about that later. Um, and epiphytic orchids serve as bioclimatic indicators. And so epiphytes, like I said before, plants that live non-parasitically in the canopy of tall or short trees, um, because they're not connected to a terrestrial water source, they have to be very, um, they, ha they have to be resilient to these long periods of time, sometimes without water. Um, and so any changes in atmospheric precipitation, so rain, fog, um, water really, um, it impacts them directly. And so their abundance and distribution is reflected of, of these climatic variations. And so as we're looking forward into climatic changes that are already happening as well, um, Orchids kind of are, serve as a way to, as a lens through which to study the process of plants responding to climatic changes. Um, and then finally, conservation and management of any type of orchid really depends on understanding its habitat preferences and the environmental variables which are driving the distribution of the species. So how can you, you can't uh, design a conservation 
plan that's effective if you have no idea where an orchid grows or what kind of place it likes or what um, conditions it needs to thrive. And so um, because there's not very much research done on the high canopies of trees, um, it's important to first learn a little bit about the canopy, uh, the high canopy before designing a management strategy. And so um, that my the intent of this project was to contribute to that process of learning more about the orchids of the high canopy. And so the main research questions here are there's so we've got 40 ish species in this area. They live in a variety of places here. Some drawings I did of different ones. Um, and then the main question then is why do some of them live in certain areas? And so you can see me in this drawing the Caulartron bilamilatum. Um, only usually lives on the highest part of the tree in a dry, sunny spot. That's where you'll find this orchid. Um, in contrast, the Dresselrella hispidia, um, I only ever found it in these shady areas on trunks. And so you have these different places where orchids are growing within a single tree. And so that um, observation leads to the question of what is the composition, the species composition of the community of epiphytic orchids in the canopy of Pyro. So first of all, where are these species and what are the species? And then second, what are the variables, environmental variables, that are influencing that diversity and abundance? So first it's figuring out where the orchids are and what the orchids are, which species they are. And then the second part is why are they there and why have they thrived or not thrived in these various um, places within a single and then tree and then expanding that to the forest in general. And so the trees um, that I was working with in those peninsula are very tall. So these were between yeah, 100 to 200 feet uh, tall, a gigantic, beautiful trees. Um, here's a few, like a Sloania in the middle with, you can see Marvin who helped me on the project in front and then a Cariocar Costa Ricensis or an Ahu tree on the left. These are massive trees with a diameter at the base of up to uh, 20 feet in some, some cases. So kind of um, redwood or sequoia-esque, but tropical um, tropical evergreen trees or deciduous in some cases, but yeah. <laughs> okay, so the process of climbing these trees was quite logistically challenging. On the left is Fry who helped me, um, his name is Fry Rodriguez and he helped me a lot um, firing the big shot into the trees. Um, so you can see him there with it's a 10 foot long uh, slingshot and he's pulling down the, the cord. I mean, there's a weight in that little yellow bag and that's attached to a small yellow string, which a lot of it is then in that little cube thing. And so as he, um, so we would identify a branch in the tree that looked safe and thick enough to climb and enough to put my whole weight on and looked like it wasn't rotten and was also high enough in the tree that I could um, survey all the orchids. And then um, Fry would help shoot the line into the right spot. And if we got that thin line over the right spot, 100 feet in the air, then we would then uh, string the thicker red line, which was my real climbing line, up in and over um, the branch. And so sometimes this process took as much as three to four hours to get the line in the right spot because you really want to make sure it's in a safe place. And then with all the vegetation in the tropical forest, it can be very hard to see and to find a place to shoot the line from. And so that was a, sometimes quite a frustrating process. Sometimes it took more time to get the line in the tree than it did to climb the tree and um, survey the orchids. So once the line is in the tree, we use um, this series of grigris and knots and slings to create an anchor on another tree nearby. So the rule was that the anchor tree needs to be bigger than your leg-ish. So something about uh, this wide and then you wrap it with the slings and the carabiners and then have this system that will uh, keep you safe as you go up into the tree. And I didn't know, or I had uh, done this a few times with a friend in Honolulu who was an arborist who taught me a little bit, um, but I hadn't never climbed really big trees before this project. And so the people at this uh, 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 bio biological station um, taught, uh, taught me how to do this um, along with my friend who is also climbing. And so once the line's up, you then inch up the line using a hand ascender so that kind of grips on the rope and you use your hand to get up. And then a foot ascender, which you can see on my foot there, which you kind of are doing this uh, hand and foot climbing up uh, the rope and you're wearing a harness as you go up. 
and it's pretty fun. You go, it takes a while to get all the way up to the top of the 100 or 200 foot tree uh, to collect data. And so I worked the entire summer with uh, Jen Schlauch, who's on uh, my left here, on my, this woman, um, and she is an entomologist. And so she studies canopy ants. And so we worked together all summer um, that she would be on the ground um, watching my safety and helping me while I studied the orchids. And then I would come down and she would go up into the tree and then she would do a survey of ant diversity Robert. Um, in the tree. And so, uh, yeah, she was a great friend and we worked together all summer and we really couldn't have collected any of this uh, data without her. You really need a climbing buddy to climb trees with. And so, yeah, here's some of the pictures of us moving up into the canopy or of me, that's me on the right. And I would have like my clipboard and I'd usually be up there for between like three to four hours, two, two to four, depending. Um, and so I would have like a snack and my clipboard with my data sheet and then all my measuring tools and some water. Um, and you'd head on up just to, to be up there for a while. Uh, it's a picture that Jen took of me up in the top of a saber. And so once you finally got to the top, you kind of find a branch that's good to sit on. And then you get yourself situated in a place where you can see all the branches and see all the orchids and then um, start to use binoculars or just if you're close enough, your eyes just to identify them and start writing down information. So this would be the view once I was up in the tree. Um, this is me sitting next to some maxillarias. Um, here you can see a whole beautiful bank of them on this high branch. And so this is like 90 feet up in the air and this community of maxillarias is just doing great. Um, and then on the right over there, I don't know what species that is from here, but there's also just the kind of the views. You'd look off down the branch and see all different types of orchids. And so you can see in this situation how having slightly lower diversity would actually help you because it, without a flower, as many of you know, it's almost impossible to identify an orchid to its species. And so many of these didn't have flowers because they only have flowers, you know, for a few days a year potentially. Um, and so having low diversity helped me make accurate identifications. Since there were only 35 potential options, I could um, often use leaves or bulbs or other characteristics if I couldn't see a, a flower um, to identify it. Ah, here's more scenes from the canopy. So there's a Sobralia on the left. Um, some kind of species of Sobralia. Oftentimes I only got to genus because if I couldn't find a flower, I couldn't get it effectively to species. So I'd just leave it at genus. Um, and you can see they often grow out of these beautiful moss mats, which I'll talk about in a, um, a little bit here about the importance of the moss in the canopy. And so you can see branches, I would look down sometimes if I couldn't, I would try to look or I was trying to identify every orchid in the tree and count their numbers. And so I would try to get to uh, parts where I could see um, branches from different angles. So I could make sure that I was seeing every angle and not potentially missing um, an orchid. And of course there is some degree in error in this. There are huge canopies. It could stretch, a branch could go 50 feet in one way and 50 feet in the other direction. And I can only move a little bit walking along the branches while I'm harnessed in. And so there is some degree of error that I, probably didn't see all the orchids up there. Um, but you know, you do what you can uh, and you just describe that very clearly in the methods uh, when you write when I hope when I need, write my article and um, it, it is contributing uh, to the general understanding of what's up there in the canopy. But the canopy really is a, a frontier and a, a mystery. Uh, it's difficult to access and not much is known about the ecology of these um, arboreal spaces. More beautiful scenes from the canopy. You can see the, these uh, ferns just dripping off of the branches. So orchids going up, ferns going down, just like thousands of individuals, uh, really beautiful. More orchid pictures. So this is all just kind of tropical forest, um, beautiful orchids. And there were often monkeys up in the canopy as well. The monkeys were a little scary. I didn't really like them too much because they'd be kind of aggressive. Sometimes they were very peaceful and they would just hang out um, in the tree or on different branches. Other times they'd be kind of aggressive and would kind of scream at me or get really close or play with my ropes. And um, that was not nice at all. So if the monkeys became too aggressive, I would just leave the tree and go down and come back another day um, since it's their space really. <laughs> 
They're very agile and can be very alarming when they scream. So um, throughout the summer, I climbed a total of 34 trees uh, of nine different species. So um, the host, I'd climbed nine different species of host tree because I was also trying to see the effect of host tree on the orchids themselves. So the different types of trees have different communities of orchids. And so uh, 34 in generally in ecology, you'd hope for a sample size larger than that, but with um, climbing really large trees, it was hard to, um, to climb lots of them. And so I was you know, fairly satisfied with 34 by the end. Uh, I think when I first started the project, I had aspired to do 100 over the course of the summer, but as the reality of how hard it was to climb them set in between getting the line in a safe place and um, hiking out to the trees, finding uh, doable trees, uh, I did 34 in the end. Usually I could climb about, I could only climb one to two if I was really going for it, two trees a day. And you have to choose a really good weather day and it takes usually about one to two. You can only do about two, you can only rig two trees a day and then you can only climb two trees a day. So it really kind of uh, take a while. This is all within about a four mile area. And so you can see here's the research station down here where the red roofs are. This is where I was living with other people at the station. And then we'd walk out every day, Jen and I, and to the different trees and uh, work on climbing. Uh, and so in the end, I found 35 species were found in the canopy. And here's some of the different pictures of them. We've got a Lockhartia down here, a Trigonidium, a Scaphiglottis, Maxillarias, um, Dressalrellas, uh, Epidendrum. So you guys might uh, recognize some of these uh, uh, genera, at least some of these uh, types of orchids, which some of which have been uh, integrated into the horticultural trade and hybrids are now made out of them. I don't know so much about that whole end of things, um, but uh, some of these are the base species orchids from what some of these hybrids um, arise. And so um, one of the questions was, so what would be the relative abundance of the various orchid species at Pyro? And so, which is basically asking which species are rare and which species are common. And so this uh, graph kind of tries to show that a little bit. So this is the results of my survey. So I made N equals, so I made 2,640 observations of orchids um, in Pyro. And this is that block color thing on the left here is showing of those all those orchid observations, how does that break down into the different species? And so you can see that um, they're not evenly distributed. And so it's not like I would find one of each of the 35 all the time. Some are much common and some are rare um, as you would expect in um, a forest system. And so you can see I found 852 Speclinia microphyllas while I only saw Cloesia wart, um, Cloesia wart, which I uh, once. And so this kind of shows the breakdown of which ones were very common. So we've got Scaphiglottis, Maxillarias, Anathalus, Camaridiums, all very common, would see them all the time. And then quite a few that I only saw once or twice. And so um, those are not quite as common in the canopy. The Jacinella, the Aspasia, some of the uh, Prosecchia abbreviatas were um, not so common. So this is interesting and good information to know for management of epiphytic orchids. Uh, first, you have to know which ones are rare and which ones are common. And so here's some examples of the common ones as a Scaphiglottis and a Speclinia. Those were just about everywhere in the canopy. And then, and so then there's a Cloesia and a Jacknellia that I only saw once of each of those. And that was very exciting to make that identification. Okay, so some more um, results uh, answering the question of what is the vertical distribution of epiphytic orchids in periods. This is wondering where, as you move up a tree, are the highest density of, uh, this is just abundance, we're not looking at diversity, just abundance of orchids, and I also put ferns on here. As you can see that I didn't find a single orchid ever in zone one, so the lowest section up to about uh, 10, 15 feet, never found an orchid there. Um, moving as I moved up the tree on the trunk would find a few. Then we would enter the area of highest abundance here in zone three. So that's the branching zone, the first branches of these big uh, gigantic forest trees. That's where all the orchids usually were found. Um, but then there's other species that were found then moving up into zone four and then the apical tips uh, of branches, a few of those as well. 
You can all, maybe you should also note here the correlation of abundance of epiphytic ferns to epiphytic orchids. So the highest abundance of ferns also occurred where there was the highest abundance of orchids. So both of these epiphytic um, life forms are living in the same part of the canopy. All right, so this is another um, part of my results. Uh, this might be a little confusing, but this is an NMDS, so a non uh, non multidimensional scaling uh, of the data points. And so basically what this sh is showing is the different communities of orchids that were existing in the canopy. And so each of the dots um, is representing a community of species that I observed. And then the arrows are representing how those communities are separating. And so what's kind of driving, not driving, but what's separating those different groups. And so that might be a little confusing, but what's important to think about here is that the different communities of species in the canopy are separating based on Johansson zone, which is place in the canopy, canopy cover, so amount of light that they're getting, and the presence of bryophytes and pteridophytes, so ferns and mosses. So this would make sense to people who are excited about the horticulture and growing orchids. Um, that the amount of light that they get, the place that they are, and the presence of other ferns and mosses is going to be very important. Um, that those are going to be driving variables for the success and diversity of um, a wild orchid population or an orchid that's growing um, in your house, in your yard. And so this, one of the results that we could kind of take from this is that there are certain um, orchids that live in open or exposed areas. So these are the communities of orchids that are preferring habitats at the tips of branches, very sunny exposed locations, or on types of trees that have open canopies that are gonna allow more light to get through. And so some of the examples of those species were Nydema, Caulartron, Brassavola, and Polystachia. And so then other species in the canopy at Pyrrha are going to be shade um, tolerant or shade orchids that I only ever found, you know, in these mossy little areas close to the trunk or um, in shaded areas underneath dense foliage or in areas with lots of other pteridophytes and bryophytes or other ferns and mosses. And so those examples were Maxillaria, Lockhartia, Sobralia, and Speclinia. And so this result kind of shows that it's not just uniform what's going on up in the high canopy. There's micro niches, so little pockets of places where certain species of orchids um, are have adapted to thrive and to grow. And so the, the, the canopy is not homogenous. It provides a variety of small niches um, that these different species have been adapted to live within and to live with each other. So here's a different vis visualization of that same concept. Um, so going out along a branch, so the base of the branch closest to the trunk, you would have your shade tolerant, um, you know, wet little community of sobralias and lockhartias and nice little flappy leafed, thin leafed things. And then as you're going out on the branch, it gets more and more exposed, hotter, um, less moss, less ferns. It's a newer part of the growing tip. And so it's fresher bark. So it's not as, um, it's potentially less textured. Um, to hold less moisture as the older parts of the same branch. So then as you move out, you're going to get your nidemas and calarthrons, demerandra, and polystachia. And so there's differentiation along a single branch. And this is really fascinating that this branch might be only 30 or 40 feet long, but you're going to have different communities of orchids living with on, um, within it and on it. So I drew this to kind of show this uh, this concept. It's not a scientifically supported drawing yet, but I'm still working on the analysis part of this project to kind of uh, back up some of these things I'm saying. Moving on. And so um, a final bit of the analysis I'll try to share with you guys today was I used these models called structural equation models to figure out which um, variables are driving orchid abundance and diversity. And so this might look really messy and confusing, but what it's basically showing is that there are a variety of established variables which influence orchid fitness. And you folks will probably know this, right? That um, precip uh, precipitation, so water will influence fitness, humidity will influence fitness, temperature, elevation, um, all um, impact whether an orchid will do well. Um, moving beyond that, we have social, in a forest setting, we have social drivers. And so what happened to the land 
um, historically, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, two weeks ago, will have impacts on the habitat for the orchids. Of course, if they're getting harvested, that also impacts them. Over on the right, we have host characteristics. And so that's the tree that the orchid lives upon. So the different characteristics of that tree. So nutrients in the bark, the size of the tree, the age of the tree, the density of the leaves in that tree, bark texture, phenology is when it flowers or when it loses its leaves. And so those are all also going to impact um, a orchid living within that tree. And then we've got some other biotic ones, so bryophytes and lichens, whether or not there's surround, and then mycorrhizal fungi, of course, which are, I didn't look at mycorrhizal fungi at all in this project, because um, that would be a whole nother project, but they're very important for, um, as we all know, for orchid establishment and growth. And so what this diagram is trying to show is that these variables all influence orchid abundance and diversity, but not just directly, they also, in, um, they work in a network. And so perhaps precipitation is going to impact the humidity, which then in, um, impacts uh, orchid diversity, or humidity is going to drive the distribution of mosses, and that's then going to inf influence orchids. Um, or maybe the canopy cover of the host, so if it's a fig or a, a ficus maybe, or a banyan a tree, the density of the leaves will then impact the humidity, which would then impact orchid diversity. And so, um, the, it might not be a very intuitively uh, diagram. It's just showing that um, these variables are interacting with each other to influence orchid abundance. And so there's a lot of studies that have looked at the individual impacts and correlations of each of these variables um, on an orchid's abundance and diversity in the wild, but there's not too many that try to do interactive effects with these structural um, network models. And so that's what I am in the process of trying to do is to use my data set to try to make a network model and to test these different networks to see what is interactively working on uh, driving these communities. And so I can show you a preliminary result of this. Um, oops. Um, so we, uh, I kind of distilled all of those factors into the, just these five variables that seem to be most important in Costa Rica. And so those variables were location in the canopy, surrounding bryophytes or mosses, pteridophytes or fern density, surface area, and canopy cover. All of those were the most important within my data set. And among those, um, the most important positive correlating factors were bryophytes, pteridophytes, and orchids all had this kind of like positive feedback loop. Um, and I'm still working on the analysis, so I can't like totally uh, put, uh, say that this is a, a significant result yet, but I, it's looking like um, the presence of a moss layer might then facilitate the presence of thick ferns around it on a branch, which would then positively facilitate orchid um, abundance and growth. And so this is really interesting because it's showing this kind of cascading effect of one organism allowing um, mediating an environment or kind of changing it so the next one can then be successful, which will then allow for the orchid to be uh, successful. And so these are the, um, the models that I'm working on now and uh, hopefully we'll finish so I can, uh, for my dissertation. And yeah, and so in conclusion, my, or my preliminary conclusions for this research was that epiphytic orchids in Piro in Costa Rica are not hetero, are not homogeneously distributed, but are heterogeneously distributed. So they're unevenly distributed in the canopy. And that, that varies based um, vertically and between different host species. Um, and there's evidence to support the hypothesis of habitat facilitation cascades between moss, ferns, and orchids. And um, finally, that there are orchid communities of open and closed canopy groups in Pira, which are differentially influenced by moss and fern layers. And so this um, with kind of the results of my uh, working in Costa Rica for the summer. And I hope, definitely hope that I can go back sometime and ask more questions and get to climb more of those trees. It was a really beautiful experience to get to learn how to climb, uh, to get to spend time up in the canopy, which is just one of the most beautiful um, environments I've ever been in and get to become familiar with this set um, of orchids and ask questions about why they are in certain places. Uh, 
Yeah. Oh, and yeah, I'd like to say thank you to all the people in Costa Rica who worked at the field station and who helped me work. Um, Jen, uh, the people who helped me in the field, um, and the other people who uh, were my friends uh, throughout that period in, uh, at the Piro Biological Station. And so that's all I have for today. The people who've been funding my project, thank you to all these different organizations who've been funding uh, my pr different projects through the last few years. Um, and yeah, huge mahalo to the Honolulu Orchid Society, Society for having me speak again. I uh, really enjoy speaking to you guys. Um, yeah, and hope to be in person next year. And we'll be really happy to try to answer any questions you might have either about Oaxaca or about Costa Rica. Hi, Julia. This is uh, Kate Leonard. I was I was just wondering, did you learn about the species in Costa Rica after you got there, or was that something that um, th th that you you knew and and chose that project because there were orchids you were already familiar with? No, I wasn't familiar with those orchids before I went there. I mostly just chose it because. Um, this organization was offering a six or seven month fellowship to live at the field station. So I applied with, um, with my project and you know, just have to kind of follow the funding that's available. But once I got there, I taught or I learned from the, with help from people there, the orchid species and worked on getting good at identifying them. Well, it was, it's a uh, very amazing and I'm sure everyone would agree that it's just spectacular of you to share this with us. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Julie, I want to thank you for your presentation. I am blown away. It was <laughs> so, so good. Um, we had talked a little bit earlier about the circumstance which led you to Costa Rica, and you were saying that your work in Mexico was being restricted because of COVID and you couldn't travel there. And then this Costa Rican fellowship became available and it actually allowed you to travel and stay in one place that didn't have a lot of people. So that all kind of worked out. Um, but the work is fascinating. There's so many things going on and obviously it's not easy to do what you do. So that's why we don't have as much information. Yeah, thanks, Brad. Um, yeah, well, um, yeah, on on this part about needing to go to Costa Rica instead, especially because my project in Mexico is really based on this big celebration and this big um, kind of in-person event in which they have big parades and they do these big celebrations. All of that was canceled for two years. And so no one went out and collected orchids or did any d decorations for two years. So that's why I couldn't really go there. There wasn't really anything to do. and. Um, because it's such a social project there, I have to interact with a lot of people. So it wouldn't really have been right to try to go and do a lot of in-person interactions when COVID was a problem. Um, and in Costa Rica, it, it wasn't really a social project. It was just me and Jen out in the uh, forest with orchids. So that um, enabled it to be a little bit more feasible for the pandemic. Yeah. So I, I have one question regarding the Mexico work. If if those orchids grow well on trees, and I think you told us before that there are certain trees, species that the orchids prefer, can those same orchids grow more in town or do they really need that environment out with the trees? Um, people grow them in town. Yeah, so some of the people, especially the harvesters will take some of those pseudobulbs and bring them back to their gardens and courtyards and patios and grow them there. But they take a lot of care in those environments. So you couldn't really just leave them on the tree there. You'd have to water them quite a bit and kind of, it, it would be more of a horticultural situation. Um, whereas in the habitat that is suitable to them, like in the place where we transplanted them, you could just leave them there and they'll do quite well, hopefully, um, without too much care. Yeah, I mean, you could, I've seen people put them on like uh, plastic Coke bottles or um, growing them on metal. Like, they, I mean, they're pretty vigorous if you water them and are, the, um, as you folks know too, like you can grow orchids on a variety of like materials. And if you're um, attentive, they can do well, uh, but they will thrive if they're on their correct host species of tree. 
Julie, I was wondering, you said you saw monkeys up in the trees. Did you run across any other animals like snakes or anything in the canopy? Um, not in the, can in the canopy. I was always afraid of seeing a snake and never did. Um, so that was good. But I did, we did see lots of very poisonous snakes on the ground around Costa Rica because there's uh, tercio pelos, which are fertilance snakes. They are all over the forest floor there. And so it was more concern like getting to the tree and then, but once I was, we were up in the tree, you were kind of like safe from the fertile lances and so, oh, okay. um, yeah. Interesting. So, so Julia, uh, when you talked to us a couple of years ago about your um, Oaxala, I'm, Oaxala, I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, project, at that time, there was a horticultural aspect of it where you were collecting it and you were trying to, grow them, not in a greenhouse per se, but it was almost like you were mounting them to fencing or you were trying to, you were trying to cultivate them and then reintroduce them as opposed to just picking the most viable pseudobulbs. I was wondering how that worked out. Yeah, um, it, it worked out well. The main purpose of trying to grow them on that fence like you're remembering is because um, we were just trying to see if it was even possible for this species to grow from single pseudobulbs and like re uh, produce roots. And kind of, if once we had the information that it was possible, we then moved on to just sticking them on trees. Um, but I do think that it would be a po potential solution in the future to grow them for a while. Or this is kind of up for debate is whether or not to just immediately put the bulbs onto the tree or to try to cultivate them in a greenhouse for maybe a few months first. And then once they're more established than then moving them. Um, it's unknown what would cause more stress, moving them once they have roots or um, putting them into the, the forest when the, um, without any roots. And so that could be something we experiment with in the future. Something kind of detracting from the idea of working and then is because there are no nurseries in this town that would really be suitable for this. And so trying to make it as simple and as economically feasible for people there would just be to immediately put them onto the trees and not really worry about cultivation too much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, hi, Julia. I was actually wondering like what, cause I wasn't here two years ago. So I was just wondering like what really got you interested and like what positions did you really try and find at UH that was able to help you get into this position? Um, yeah, I started as a master's student in Tamara Tickton's lab, who's, or I'm still in her lab um, at UH in the botany department. And I just really wanted, I wanted to work um, in anywhere in Central America with any plant. <laughs> and um, Tamara was working with orchids already in Oaxaca. And so she kind of sent me or to Oaxaca or kind of honed me in on Oaxaca as a place that has a history of orchid use. And uh, she had already been working and had collaborators there. And so um, that's how I initially got interested in it. And I, once you get really excited about uh, orchids especially or any kind of a specialty then you just get more and more interested and excited about it um and yeah and so I started as a master's student and um yeah I got like a few small grants that kind of helped me go there one summer and then the next summer uh and yeah I mean I'm not really in any it's like I don't really have a fixed position or anything I'm just still a grad student and I'm kind of funding this my pro my dissertation through like a series of small grants. Um, and so, I mean, I, one day I hope to get a real job, but I, I don't have one right now. <laughs> yeah, but that's, it's very interesting. Like I just want to one day maybe go to school for something like that too. It sounds very like an interesting career choice and just like, yeah, you know, it's just fun, it seems to me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think a, a big component is finding an advisor who's really supportive of doing international projects and wants to support you, not financially, but conceptually support you to kind of follow what you're interested in. And then after that, just looking for um, grants that are offered by various organizations to find your own money, because like once or one, not find money to for the project, because once you have that, then you're kind of an independent grad student, you don't really have to be too dependent on um, staying at UH or kind of doing someone else's project, you kind of can do what you'd like. <laughs> so yeah, I, it's very possible to 
research things you're interested in, especially orchids. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I actually have one more quick question about something else too. I was wondering, because when you said um, uh, that orchids, a lot of them can grow in like communities and clusters. I was wondering, because I know some other types of plants, like when they are clustered up, they usually tend to fuse a little bit, right? So I was wondering, can that also happen with orchids too? Like, can, do they somehow, are they somehow able to fuse into a bigger plant? Hmm, like, um, like multiple individuals kind of growing together. Yeah, um, like. I mean, I mean, I think what in my, when I was observing things, I wasn't observing them through time. I would just see them once when I climbed the tree. And so I couldn't tell if I just saw a thicket of orchids, they look like thickets kind of. Um, I couldn't tell if that had been multiple and they had kind of grown all together or if it was just one and then had slowly grown. So, I mean, there's some interesting questions that would come out of observing a population for a long period of time. Um, so I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't know if they, Multi in two individuals can fuse their roots. I guess I haven't observed that, but um, them clonally reproducing, so a single orchid even thicker and thicker and thicker on a branch and then parts dying and then parts growing again, again I think uh, is a possibility, but I don't know too much about that. Oh, thank you though for the information. Yeah. Yeah, right on, yeah. I have a question, Julia. This is Linda Inoue. Um, Hi. What was your childhood like that? Um, did you have a childhood interest in botany or in plants of any kind? Yeah, I think I always was really into plants. I grew up on like halfway up Round Top Tantalus, and so I um, spent a lot of time like on all the trails up there and hiking around and poking around in our yard and really liked, I guess, plants. I, I, um, I mean, growing up, I didn't really know that a lot of the plants in Hawaii are invasive. And so like our whole yard was totally invasive and I just thought it was great for a long time. And it was kind of like later once I started studying botany that I realized like, oh, they're all, that none of those are good plants. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I guess I first got really into botany through getting excited about native Hawaiian plants. Like after undergrad, I did a few like temporary technician jobs working with plant conservation in Hawaii on the Big Island and Kauai. And um, then from that kind of wanted to do a botany uh, degree. And then from there wanted to study orchids. But I think in the long run, yeah, I'd like to study Hawaiian plants probably and come back home um, predominantly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There's also, this is a, a side comment, but we do have like a really interesting flora of, um, of our own native Hawaiian epiphytes. I mean, we don't have too many epiphytic orchids like you guys know, but we have really amazing and diverse epiphytic ferns that live in our cloud forests. And so that's something that I'd really like to study next is uh, epiphytic ferns up in the Ko'olaus or on other cloud forests throughout the state. Not too many people study them. There's only a handful of people who are really interested in looking at the epiphytic ferns of Hawaii. And so that's something I would be interested in. I am interested in. Julia, are there a great number of those ferns? Yeah, we've got like maybe as many as 30 or 40 species that are endemic, so native to Hawaii of um, native ferns they grow up in the ohias you know like sometimes there's so many of the ferns maybe some of you have probably seen it on hikes up to the summit koala areas but like so thick that they'll overcome the ohia tree almost you know just like loaded every and those are in the genus uh adenophorus and alaphoglossum um yeah so we we have some beautiful epiphytes Julie, I was uh, really intrigued with the climbing that you did because uh, I don't think many of us can do that. Uh, what, what kind of training did you have uh, to do that kind of climbing? Um, probably not not too much, really. I um, I'm like I had climbed with my friend who's an arborist around Honolulu. We had like climbed around the city a little bit, and then. Um, after that, I just kind of got there and started doing it. The first few times that I climbed, I was really a, was quite scared. Like in, when I got really high, um, 
Yeah. Like, I mean, I remember the first time I climbed like 150 foot tree, like my like hand was shaking. So I couldn't write anything down. And like, I was so scared. I couldn't really move around or like do anything. And like, it was actually kind of disheartening. Like the first time I, I climbed under the trees is like, oh, this is really hard and it's really scary. And I don't think, I don't know if I can do it, but I got pretty, I got used to it. And like, you kind of accustomed to being up high and just kind of not um, as afraid of just the space beneath you and it, you kind of get more comfortable and um, yeah, so you, you, you get accustomed to it. And then physically, like it's hard to, um, it's hard, but only very specific muscles, I think. And so like, once you kind of get that weird muscle set, then you're, you're good. <laughs> Do you have any near accidents? Um, yeah, we did actually. I, I think that I would like more training because there were some scary instances like um, once having a, the rope, it was kind of an optical illusion that it looked like the rope was going over a really big, thick, like huge branch, but it was only actually going around a branch like as thin as my wrist maybe. Um, and because that was kind of hidden, you know, just like the way the rope looks, it's hard to tell sometimes. And so like I got all the way up to the top and then saw that it was on a really thin branch, which is very scary and then go, went all the way down again. Then you like take everything apart and then reshoot the line and everything. But yeah, there's some scary things. I mean, it's hard to have, uh, it's like an inherently risky activity. Um, and so, yeah, but I think as I, I hope to get trained and learn more so I can be safer. Yeah. And Julia, it looked like the area was pretty isolated. So if there was an accident, it would be pretty difficult to get help. Yeah, I had, yeah, I think that's true as well. It was like a, an hour and a half down a dirt road to this uh, station and the nearest town didn't really have a very good hospital. So yeah, there were um, a, few, a few factors um, that would have gone bad, but luckily nothing went bad. and. I mean, we tried as hard as we could to make things safe and we weren't really trying to take risks necessarily. We were just trying to get our, info, our data as safely as possible. It wasn't like a thrill seeking activity, although it was thrilling, that wasn't the intent, that wasn't the point yet. So, so was, there, um, was there synergy between the ant study and the orchid study or you were just in the same place at the same time? Um, we didn't plan it together. Like they had, they picked the two of us to get the fellowship separately. And then we kind of became friends and ended up working together um, really luckily. But um, interestingly enough, we, um, she, Jen and I would like to write some kind of paper together or like look at um, correlations because there were interesting correlations between ant diversity and orchid diversity in the canopy. And that kind of um, data set of having like someone looking at botany and um, insect diversity in a canopy is pretty rare. Like usually just like one type of interest gets uh, focused on. And so, yeah, we plan to both do that in the future. We're both grad students. And so uh, kind of moving slow on that, but um, yeah, it turned out actually that the areas that were higher in orchid diversity. So these wet shady areas actually had lower ant diversity and the ants really liked these like sunny open areas where there would be lots of species and they'd be running around looking for food or something um and so yeah there, there are some interesting things that we found for sure do the concheros have any kind of rules or regulations that need to follow when harvesting the prosecchia carwinskii or are they harvesting every single yellow flower that they find or is it something to do with like uh maybe it's a, a minimum number of pseudobulbs on a plant before they can harvest yeah that's a really interesting question they um it depends who you ask and what who you, like some of the older or some some of the orchid harvesters will just take every single flower they see on a tree and other ones are kind of more um, aware of the sustainability of populations and will only take half of the pseudobulbs. Um, and so it kind of varies between the different ones. I think there's a little bit of a, of like an, 
educational gap between understanding that the population of orchids comes from the reproduct the flower structure. Like I think a lot of the um, people who are harvesting or orchids kind of think that they're clonally reproduced. They just kind of grow from each other on trees and don't realize that the impact of taking an entire flower, especially for a, a orchid that only blooms once a year, because if you if you return to a population every year and take every single reproductive flower of that population, you're just the, the number of seedlings you'll get would just go down and down and down and down, which is, what, is what's happened. And so I think kind of that educational piece um, would it hopefully do a lot. So no, they don't really follow too many regulations right now. Like as I was saying, the, the decline of orchid numbers has happened really fast. And so it's happened fast enough that they haven't really responded by creating a sustainable strategy. Like what used to be fine in the past um, has changed within a generation. So like the grandfathers of the current Concheros, they used to be able to take thousands and thousands and thousands with there being not really any impact um, or they were able to do that for quite a while. At least there probably was an impact. Um, so yeah, it's it's. I think the tradition and the population of this plant are both in times of active transition like things are actively changing within this the last decade or so and so um and then from a federal perspective harvesting this orchid is entirely illegal from a mexican government perspective like it's federally protected it's on the endangered species list but that's just kind of um, broadly disregarded um by a crop and it's in that's disregarded by many communities with many species of orchid which just kind of reflects that like an effective strategy can't just be like a federal blanket ban it has to be like a community-based conservation plan um yeah are there uh orchid nurseries in uh costa rica or mexico yeah there there are but um yeah, I mean, people are growing like in vitro, growing large quantities of species orchids in Mexico. I'm not super familiar with um, the people involved in that, but the main kind of problem, at least for Oaxaca and conservation, is that the people who are, are in control of these plants are these really rural, small communities with not a lot of economic resources, and they can't really have a in vitro success of like big orchid greenhouse. And so, um, uh, unless there was like some kind of neat project in which, you know, prop propagules were sent to the labs in bigger cities and then they were sent back to plant in the um, in the forest. And that would be really great. Uh, that's kind of beyond my ability to facilitate, but I think that'd be great if that was set up. Yeah. And in Costa Rica, I'm not sure what the um, people love orchids there and there's a lot of growers and a lot of greenhouses. Um, I guess I've never heard of a project which climbs into the high canopy to plant orchids, though. That'd be really neat. I'd like to do that, but um, I don't think anyone's doing that right now. People are kind of focusing on the lower forests, mm -hmm. focusing on horticulture, kind of uh, not in the canopy. So, Julia, in Costa Rica, in the canopy, it looks like all of those orchids are sort of endemic or happen naturally. How do you think they got there? Um, I mean, I think they kind of evolved to be part of that system. Um, most of the species that are there are common and widespread. And so almost all of the 31, 35 species I was studying have distributions, a lot of them that go all the way from like the Southern US all the way down to Brazil. And so they're big, wide distribution, common species. And the seeds of these species are probably like so common that we're like, you're breathing them in if you visit Central America. Um, or if not that common, that at least that they get distributed quite a bit. And they're quite, um, they're like pretty scrappy species. Like they're uh, capable of living in a variety of uh, habitats when the seed falls in a correct place. Um, but beyond that, I, I don't know if I'm not, uh, qualified to talk, speak too much about the evolution of orchids. I'm only able to talk about ecology and distributions slightly. It, yeah, no. it was interesting where you didn't observe that many that were lower to the ground. Mm. Most of them were kind of caught in that first area of branches. 
Yeah, that's something I've wondered about too, because it's like there's nice little mossy nooks at eye level or about one foot off the ground. And I never found anything down there. Um, I don't really know why. Uh, it could just be quite shady. It's just like too dark. It's quite dark down in that section of the forest. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Okay, we'll take one more question. Thank you very much for answering our questions. Uh, your work is fascinating though. Any more questions? Go ahead and unmute yourself. For the, the project in Mexico, does your restoration uh, strategy have any way to deal with maintaining genetic diversity? Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, and that's one of the biggest criticisms usually about this restoration plan and what I'm doing is that um, there's not enough pot uh, attention paid to genetic diversity because the concheros, the orchid harvesters, go out across the entire state to harvest this species. And so um, it probably is only this one species, like they're not mixing species, but they are getting it from all these different populations, which have um, genetics, which are, you know, adapted to those different areas, you know, slightly colder, slightly wetter, all these different um, genetic variations, and no one's done population genetics on this species, so we don't really know about the existing diversity. So these orchid harvesters are bringing all these back, they're mixing them when they create these big decorations, they're getting thrown around and um, put in boxes and moved around. So I have, by the time they have arrived to me, I um, don't have any idea where they've come from. And then I'm just reintroducing them in a big patch of mixed genetics. And so this is a somewhat problematic uh, practice. And I acknowledge that, but the only um, real response to that is that um, if, if no one was growing them, they would just be discarded and they would just be thrown away. Um, and there aren't too many instances of um, mixing population genetics really resulting in negative impacts on the genetics of a, of a species of orchid. And so, and then the final idea is also that this is not really a truly wild place. Like I'm not introducing them way back into a, a you know, pristine preserve of orchids. This is more of an inter C2 site. And so there's like a farmhouse, you know, that's quite close. This is kind of a place where people come and go a lot. It is a forest of adequate trees, but it's not a preserve by any means. It's like a mixed use landscape. And then the idea also is that the this population of this like weird Frankenstein mix of uh, population genetics will also be, if it's successful, a place where the people of this town can go in the future and harvest from this site. And so it could be an inter C2 kind of harvest site um, with with mixed genetics, but uh, that hopefully won't be too much of a problem. And then the other good response too would be maybe I should work with someone who could do the population genetics and uh, we could figure, uh, learn more about the species. Thank you for staying and answering our questions. Um, if there are other questions, please do send them to me and I might be able to pass them along to Julia. We want to thank you for your outstanding presentation. It, it makes us think a lot and makes us much more aware of uh, conservation efforts, which will have a positive impact in the future, hopefully. And we're also um, very excited to hear about any future work that you might have, um, either in Hawaii or other places, whether orchids or ferns or anything else. Everything is very, very uh, complex and interesting. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, folks. It's so great to talk to you. I uh, really enjoy talking to the Hunlu Orchid Site. It's a very enthusiastic group, and uh, it's really great to talk to people who are super, like, honestly enthusiastic about plants and growing them. So thank you, folks, and hope to see you when I'm home in a year in person. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you.